Well, it's also really, really messy if you look at it as a computer scientist with some expectation of systems making sense. Um, you know, law is defined as a collection of exceptions. Um, you know, it's all about fuzzy thinking and special cases and unclear language. Um, law is exceptionally dense. Uh, if you think that written language is, um, you know, much denser than most, you know, per like, uh, um, uh, semantic content per phoneme or semantic content per character of uh, lawyer speak is much, much higher than it is for C code. Um, you know, the, uh, the US legal code is some tens of millions of words trying to, you know, and it's, it's not well separated. Um, you know, you can't like say, oh, this chunk doesn't affect anything else. This chunk over here doesn't affect anything else. It's all interlinked. So trying to do any kind of analysis work on this is a nightmare. Um, it's all not separated from the social context, like the entire idea of positive rights and that kind of thing. Um, there's some fascinating, fascinating uh, studies in China where people are trying to impose these ideas of civil rights and positive law and that kind of stuff, which don't make sense in the cultural context. So you can make the law, but it doesn't actually mean what you think it means necessarily. Uh, legal traditions are really interesting beasts too. Um, you know, uh, law is embedded in human traditions. So this is kind of where all of that cultural interpretation comes from. Um, the context for law is a tradition. A tradition is a pool of information. That pool changes over time. Different bits of it are emphasized at different time periods. Um, this is, you know, the kind of the way traditions evolve. Meaning doesn't just, doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's sort of pulled from different pieces that are already in the tradition. Um, if you introduce something new to a tradition, even if that tradition rejects it, you change the tradition because it now has more information in it. Um, so, I'm not going to get into too, many de too much detail about how law is normally created. Um, but basically, you have some set of enabled and empowered actors who are the people who are kind of supposed to be creating law. And they sort of add little bits and pieces to a legal structure over time. And it slowly grows and grows and grows into this massive behemoth, you know, centuries later. Um, constitutional law is really different, though, because with a constitution, a lot of the time you say, OK, we're just going to strike out everything that came before. And we're going to start over from scratch. Possibly, you know, we'll kind of keep some of the existing law and just impose a constitution on it. Or possibly we'll just get rid of everything and start, you know, our entire legal code over from scratch. Um, but even if you're keeping the legal code, it still changes the fundamental meaning of that legal code. Um, so you don't necessarily have to deal with the full complexity of this massive centuries-old legal structure when you're dealing with the constitution. You can deal with it as a separate abstract entity. Um, you still have to pay attention to the culture, the cultural and the legal context, because that determines like the kind of law that you want to be, you know, that's possible within that constitutional scope. So various people have tried analytic law in the past. Um, it hasn't worked that well most of the time. Um, the Romans sort of started things off when they tried to start systematizing civil law. It, uh, they didn't get that far, and they weren't trying to get that far, but they did, they, they kind of introduced the idea that you could have analytic law. Um, all of the previous legal structures didn't have a concept of analytic law. Um, this mostly got put on hold until about the 17th century. Um, during the, the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, a certain amount of systematization, systematization happened with the, um, the, the shift as uh, church law and Roman law merged. Uh, basically, there was this kind of, at, at a certain point, there were like four or five separate bodies of law, you know, um, maritime law, canon law, um, civil law, and they all kind of got merged and got systematized a bit. Um, but then at a certain point, uh, Leibniz got bored and took some time off from the calculus and said, right, this, this whole law thing, it's not going to stand. We're going to make law something that you can actually do proper deductive logic on. And, you know, we will make this fully logical system. Um, he failed. Uh, not a chance. But he did get to the point where the previous legal structures were now amenable to deductive logic. Um, previously, the, the idea of deduction didn't 
it was not a coherent form of uh, logical argument within the code of law. So he introduced that um, in the uh, Corpus Juris Reconsinatum. Um, you know, he built a new way of thinking about law. Um, this kind of systematizing of civil codes continued over time, um, never really became fully computable. Uh, common law followed course, the, uh, the narrative of like the 19th and 20th century was the narrative of the civilization of common law in the sense of becoming closer and closer to the civil code. Um, a bunch of the other legal structures haven't really gone through this process. Um, for instance, uh, deductive reasoning is not allowed in Sharia law. It is, it is considered an unacceptable form of argument. There are kind of acceptable and unacceptable logics. And this is true in a lot of other uh, legal traditions. <coughs> So now I want to talk a bit about Iceland, um, and this will all start coming together in a minute. Um, so Iceland was a very pretty country that uh, now, well, doesn't quite, but for a while had a bit of a smoking hole where its economy used to be. Um, so sudden economic collapse, followed by governmental replacement, uh, significant social unrest, um, although not that bad in the, in the greater scope that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing now. Um, but there was a, a serious societal demand for more fundamental changes in governance. In 2010, they began the process of replacing their constitution. Uh, they had a national forum where they basically took everyone who was eligible to vote in the country and held a lottery and picked a thousand people and put them all in the room and said, okay, tell us what our new constitution should say. And uh, those thousand people set an agenda for a constitutional assembly uh, so 525 people ran for a 25-seat constitutional assembly, um, which was going to be tasked with the process of replacing the constitution based on what the National Forum had said. Um, then things got really weird, um, and there was a court case that basically the Supreme Court decided they didn't like what was going on and invalidated the elections on completely spurious grounds, um, and then... Um, it kind of went back and forth, and eventually the uh, I'll think he said that we're going to simply seat the existing assembly by fiat, and that they are now empowered without holding another election, and yeah, it was all very messy. Um, anyway, so uh, this group basically ran an agile dev process for writing a constitution. They had uh, three sub-teams within the assembly that ran week-long uh, sprints on the document. Um, they were originally planning on completing a draft by June 16th. That was extended to mid-July. Um, you know, like any other dev project, things kind of ran longer than expected. It turns out that uh, project management for constitutions is just as hard as any other piece of code. Um, but they posted every week's drafts online. You know, you could go look at it. Uh, they received comments by message board and by Facebook. Um, and responded to all of them, integrated all of them where they made sense, or debated all of them. Um, you know, so, so in a lot of ways, it was a very transparent process. Um, it wasn't actually crowdsourced. And there's a, there was a, a Guardian article going around um, which basically said, you know, Iceland crowdsourcing new constitution is not actually true. Um, you know, they, they had an assembly. The, uh, the assembly wrote, well, almost all the language. We'll get to that later. But, um, the assembly wrote most of the language directly, and um, you know took took suggestions, looked at suggestions, but the uh, the actual document wasn't crowdsourced as such. Um, so the uh, final document was submitted to the Althingi in August, and the Althingi has done um, nothing. Yeah, there's ongoing politics. Uh, the politics will probably continue ongoing for a little while. There's uh, continuing pressure. Um, basically, the conservative elements uh, in Parliament are trying to not uh, let it uh, get discussed because if it gets discussed, it's going to be clear that they're the ones who don't want it adopted, and being seen as not wanting a new constitution adopted will be politically poisonous. So they're playing procedural games. But uh, you know, there's there is continuing pressure being put on the Althingi to bring the document under discussion, um, and hopefully that will happen soon. So Icelandic law is actually really kind of interesting, uh, especially to someone who's coming from an American legal background. Um, the right of an individual to defend themselves in court without needing representation is taken very seriously, um, such that you are not expected to be familiar with mountains and mountains of case law, and if you have a reasonable interpretation of the language, 
that holds a lot of weight in court. Um, there's no particular standing for case law. So if you just show up and say, okay, well, you know, I read the law and I thought it said this and that's why I did what I did, the judge is actually going to listen to you. Which means that the details of the language and the exact logical structure that's encoded in the language is really, really important because that's the way it's actually going to be ruled on. Um, you know, if he says, well, no, that word doesn't actually mean what you thought it means, then you lose. You know, but it's it's not it's not well. That word doesn't mean what you thought it means because there's this obscure case from the 18th century that you know defined what it actually means. Then you know it doesn't matter. Um, so this means that the the law becomes more self-contained and more code-like. Um, a constitution is kind of even more self-contained and tractable, um, but especially within this uh, within this context where you have very code-like language. So. Last October, I was in this Thai place in Reykjavik, um, just completely out of my head. I'd had a cold for like 25,000 air miles, and I meet this insane hacker, and we get to talking, and uh, he's in the back there, uh, blushing. <laughs> I'm smart. Um, so we get to talking, and we come up with this crazy idea um, that we're going to go take the tools from computer security and apply them to the new Icelandic constitutional process because, hey, we've got this thing that looks a lot like code and it's a system and it's a system of rules and it's probably got bugs in it and we know how to deal with systems of rules of code that have bugs in them. So, I mean, you could say that there's a massive amount of hubris. You know, we are clearly not remotely qualified to be doing this. Except that no one else is either, right? This is a different way of thinking about code, and it's a different way of thinking about law. And, you know, the lawyers don't know how to do this, and we do, so we're doing it. Um, you know, all the lawyers in the room can now roll their eyes, but, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure there are many Icelandic lawyers who did, did or are rolling their eyes, but, you know, it works. Um, you know, systems are systems, and the same tools work pretty much everywhere. So we took law as code and analyzed you know, the security of law, looked for bugs, looked for all the things that you do normally. Um, it turns out that analysis of law is a lot easier when you have right access to the law, because then you can fix the bugs. Um, and it, it all just sort of makes a lot of sense, because if you can say, OK, well, there's a bug here, but we can't actually do anything about it, we can just say, well, yeah, this is a bug. That's nice. you know. But if you can actually flatten out those inconsistencies, then all of a sudden, you know, a whole different set of analytic tools starts to make sense. Because you're not just doing like analysis of, well, what would happen in this case? What would happen in that case? You can then change things so it all makes sense and works the way it should. Um, we were not affiliated with the Constitutional Assembly when we did this. Um, this was an entirely amateur, unaffiliated process this time. Um, we did four separate processes which were conducted in parallel. Um, first was crowdsourcing a translation. Uh, was crowdsourcing a translation. Um, this is the only thing in the entire process which was crowdsourced, which I think is probably where that misnomer in the Guardian article came from. But, you know, um, and this was actually a lot of my, uh, largely my fault because everyone else involved in the process spoke Icelandic and I didn't, um, and I was the one doing a big chunk of the analysis, so therefore it had to be translated so I could do the work on it. Um, but also it hopefully brought in a certain amount of external visibility into the project. Um, and I think it was something which was actually quite important. Um, so textual analysis was the next chunk. Um, this is basically lint for law. You know, this is basically going through and saying, okay, this looks like a style bug, this looks like a you know, coding pattern bug, you know, this, is, this is poor usage. Um, so w this was composed kind of of a bunch of different submetrics. Um, readability indexing for looking at complexity and reading level. So, if you have a chunk of law, like a constitution, which is a basic founding law that everyone in the country has to understand, it's really important that everyone who reads it should be able to understand it. Um, if you write it in very complex language, this will not be the case. Um, there aren't algorithms for language complexity in Icelandic. Um, there are algorithms in English, but they haven't really been ported. We did some of this work in English. We did a chunk of work towards porting the algorithms to Icelandic. They didn't get finished in time because there's a lot of corpus issues where you need to have just a whole lot of text that's been manually created and 
you know, we were lacking a thousand grad students to do that for us. So next time. Um, but you know, that was still still ended up being somewhat useful. Um, we did a, a fair bit of manual checking, which hopefully in the future we'll be able to automate. Um, so looking for kind of weasel words, um, you know, things that, oh, well, that could be interpreted this way or that could be interpreted that way. It doesn't mean quite what you think it means. You know, places where structural ambiguity has been introduced into a statement of law, possibly intentionally or possibly just accidentally. Um, so unbound variable checks, exactly the same way you do with a compiler. Um, we found 19 different terms in the, what was, I guess, when I last revised these, uh, the current draft. And I don't remember if we ever looked back and found, I know a lot of them didn't get fixed in the end, but basically a bunch of different terms that were not clear from common Icelandic usage. Like, for instance, child. You know, what is what does child mean? Well, you know, it probably means the, like, you know, culturally declared, you know, individual under the age of consent, or under age of majority, or under age of something, not very well defined. Um, so, uh, a, a few different things like that. Um, some kind of higher level review looking for more ambiguous phrases. Um, one of the things that we didn't get to, but which we we planned on doing, was basically deconstructing the entire document into a set of um, completely separate predicate phrases, and just you know having a list of these and figuring out what the precedence is between all of those different predicates. You know, um, X implies Y, Y implies Z, et cetera. If you just make a list of those, you can both do chaining between them, and you can figure out if the precedence is properly specified. So, can the whole thing be properly evaluated? Um, uh, Boolean, uh, Boolean structure analysis, I skipped. Um, so basically looking for places where there are either contradictions or overly complex logical structures in the document which should be split out so that they're uh, more obvious. So a bunch of kind of different low level checks of you know, just kind of the code quality um, and finding like specific low level bugs. So next we did some design review work, which is basically you know, a bunch of people sitting around a table um, looking for potential failure cases. Um, it's not perfect, it's not very formal, but it's fast and it's expedient. Um, we spent a fair chunk of focus looking on um, like what happens in anomalous cases. So, you know, what happens if the entire um, uh, cabinet is on a plane and that plane crashes? Um, you know, is there a chain of succession? So basically making sure that we've got all of those kinds of cases either something actually you know, well-defined and sensible happens, or at least there is a, um, a you know, reasonable understanding of how, of how things would proceed. Um, so kind of just sort of design review for anomalous cases. Um, and then we did some threat modeling work. Um, so threat modeling is my area of research in computer security. I've been doing it for eight or nine years now um, as part of the Trike project with uh, Brenda Larcom. This is kind of the most direct application of security techniques into law. So um, trike and threat modeling more generally is uh, a tool and a methodology for building formal models of processes and implementations. Um, this is usually business processes like, okay, so if you have a bank that is, um, you know, you have to move money between checking accounts and there's certain checks and balances that have to happen at different points and a bunch of different workflows and that kind of thing. You know, are there um, systematic problems in the way that those workflows are defined which allow an attacker to, um, you know, cause some outcome to occur that the, uh, the bank doesn't want or that the, um, you know, the uh, account holder doesn't want or something. So um, I've done this on, on bank software, on lots and lots of, um, applications on protocols on you know like crypto protocol stuff on just kind of across the board um, but you can use it on any system which has actors and assets and uh, actors who take actions um, and you know as we've seen a constitution is just a set of rules and a lot of what's specified in a constitution is a set of business processes for how you run a country um, a um, you know, the, the evaluation of law is this complex adversarial process. You have different people who have different positions that they would like to see carried out. Um, threat modeling is a great tool for dealing with complex adversarial processes because you have different people with different goals in the system. So you can understand what those goals are and figure out, okay, 
if someone wants to, say, violate um, the judicial review process on a new law, you know, are there any avenues where they can do so? Um, threat modeling is basically a tool to make smart people smarter. It lets you kind of keep track of a lot of the moving parts of a big complex system. So, as I was saying earlier at the beginning uh, about systems having kind of bugs that appear between lots of scattered components, threat modeling is a tool that lets you keep track of all those scattered components in a formal structured way and figure out where the bugs are that sit between them. So this is a specific bug that we found, um, one of a number of them. Um, so the uh, separation of powers was a particular concern that came out of the National Forum and um, they've had some problems with it during the uh, previous, uh, uh, previous administration towards the end of things. Um, so they wanted to make sure that separation of powers were really well factored in the new document. The new constitution and the old government is a kind of a standard three-branch parliamentary democracy. Um, the uh, the Althingi is actually the oldest parliament, it's about a thousand years old. Um, so there are you know the standard set of checks and balances here between the different branches. Um, the Supreme Court has seven members normally, um, except when it has eight members or eight additional members. Um, which is the majority in the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, there are a few different circumstances under which it gets eight additional members. One of them is when it is reviewing on the constitutionality of law. Um, the Althingi gets to pick who the eight additional members are, should it be augmented. So the Althingi can pick the majority of the Supreme Court who will be reviewing the constitutionality of the law created by Althingi. Um, yeah, so we got this bug fixed. Um, you know, this was kind of an obvious one. We still don't have any idea what they were thinking. Um, it, it happens. Um, you know, this is, this is obvious, but it encapsulates the kind of problem that threat models are really good at solving. Um, in a lot of ways, threat modeling is really sort of uniquely suited to solving the kinds of problems that Leibniz was trying to pose around the computability of law. Part of why it's solved works as well as it does is because it lets us think formally about a structure of law while retaining kind of carefully placed FUDs. You know, this is not a formally computable system exactly. You know, it is a human system. It's carried out by humans. It has a certain degree of fuzz in it, but it, it puts that in a place where we can think about it as humans and kind of keep track of it. Um, civil rights completeness is one of the other issues which um, we are which threat models can be good at solving and which we're kind of working, uh, which we're interested in in general. Um, so statements of rights often have loopholes. In the US, the First Amendment specifies that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. It doesn't specify that state governments and local governments shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. It doesn't regulate um, private entities saying that, you know, uh, taking actions that abridge free speech. Um, when all of your public spaces are now malls that are controlled by private entities, you no longer have public forums that allow for free speech. Um, it doesn't control for chilling effects. Um, you know, it doesn't deal with the whole regulatory capture issue of when, um, you know, embedded interests in society can manage to shift you know, and kind of get laws passed, which, well, that's not technically a restriction on free speech. You just can't spend money for that bit of speech anymore. Um, you know, like all of the, the health and safety laws that are getting used to shut down occupations right now, right? Well, that's not a restriction on free speech. You just can't, you know, cook here. Um, so kind of understanding all of the different things which are possibly required to implement a right or, you know, uh, structures which can avert some of those loopholes being possible um, is one of the kinds of things that we're working on being able to model. Um, the results in Iceland weren't as good as we would have liked them to be. Um, we did not have the resources to do the analysis at the level we would have liked. A lot of stuff in terms of like having programmers to help with some of the, uh, getting the analysis software running and just having time for Smarty and myself to do the actual work. Um, you know, we, just, we didn't have the availability there. Um, 
We had some coordination problems, both uh, I was remote a fair chunk of the time, Smarta was busy a fair chunk of the time, um, I was also busy a fair chunk of the time, and also interactions with the assembly weren't as, as tight as we would have liked. Um, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff is stuff that we could solve really easily by having a bit more formal involvement and a bit of funding. Um, we didn't get to pre present our results formally because we weren't part, we weren't a formal part of the process. It was something that we'd hoped uh, we would be able to arrange, but didn't end up happening. Um, you know, but uh, we did end up, uh, you know, presenting a lot of the suggestions informally that would have been in the final document. Um, I think the result of the work ended up significantly improving the quality of the eventual constitution. And we did have a number of articles that we presented as basically suggestions um, that had come out of the analysis work adopted verbatim into the final document. So, um, you know, for something that was a completely unfunded, amateur, unaffiliated effort, I'm really pretty happy with how it turned out. Um, and I think we can do a lot better the next time. Um, in general, we have a, a crisis in governance globally. Um, you know, the democratic institutions that we've been trying to build and trying to rely on just aren't working. They're not getting us the results that we need. They're not dealing with significant global problems. Um, we have mass regulatory capture. You know, governments are mostly run by embedded interests everywhere in the world now. Um, we have no ability to take fundamental actions that we need as a civilization for basic resilience. Um, complete lack of transparency in power structures. Um, basically, we need prototypes for how to run a planet openly. Um, and that's kind of one of the larger goals for the CAST work, is hopefully to provide one of those prototypes for how one can work towards running a planet more openly and building systems of governance more openly. We are uh, we're currently in talk with uh, a number of countries in North Africa, um, uh, with people in a number of countries in North Africa, I should say, um, and we're kind of keeping an eye on the situation in a few different in a few other states. Um, South Sudan will be going through a constitutional process within the next five years. Um, Greece seems likely to be going through a constitutional <laughs> process too. Um, you know, Spain probably, they already have a, some constitutional reform movements. Maybe France, um, you know, we've, uh, we've offered developmental aid around democracy to the UK because it would be really nice if they had a democracy. Um, so, uh, that's the, uh, the website for That's the website for the Constitutional Analysis Support Team and the website for the Trike Threat Modeling Methodology. Um, thanks to many, many people whose names I will not read because I would mispronounce all of them, um, except for Smari. And uh, yeah, questions? How much text did you have to analyze? Um, it was, you know, maybe. Ten pages? Yeah, I mean, it's about ten pages that needed to be reanalyzed every week. Yeah. But we didn't get. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because they're doing a, a sprint every week. The 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 goal was to basically do you know get a translation crowdsourced over the weekend, do analysis Monday and Tuesday, have results back to them on Wednesday at the latest, preferably faster, so that they could then have a day to go over those when they're. Um, kind of going over a lot of other public comments on Thursday, so that they wouldn't necessarily get rolled back into the next week's sprint, but they get they could go into the week after that. Um, so you can't really take a Swedish law like this? Mm. Yeah, no, no. So that's, I mean, basically constitutions are small enough as to be tractable, mm -hmm. that you can have a team that's doing the analysis in, if not real time, then, then close to real time. And, you know, in theory, as we got stuff further and further, you know, basically as the process got tuned and as they got further along, we only really have to analyze like the new paragraph, you know, or whatever's come out that week. We don't have to start over from scratch, obviously. It's just like, okay, you've introduced some new code. How does that change the meaning of the rest of this code? Let's update our model. Let's, you know, do do checks and revisions and that kind of stuff. So you have to use the method while building the new laws. Did you can't take an existing law? Well, you could take an existing law. I mean, because that's basically what we're doing. Is we're, we're working from a snapshot of code and then saying, okay, let's find the bugs in this, right? 
but it works much better if you can then just have those bugs fixed right away. Um, because one of the problems is that a lot of the bugs are sometimes like fundamental structural bugs, right? That, you know, if, if like stuff like that judiciary bug, you know, if, they, if there had been a lot of other structure built up on top of that fundamental assumption of that's how the judiciary works, and then you change how the judiciary works, like, yes, they might fix that, but who knows what other bugs they're going to introduce by fixing that, so you need to have kind of an iterative process, and it's a lot easier just to do it while you're writing it. Um, a little question of structure. Of course, right? I've read a little bit of the Swedish law and a bit, bit of the Norwegian law, and it looks to me like it's full of go-tos. Like, there is no function, there are no function calls. There is nothing, okay, so here's a definition of something, and then let, let's use that definition in the many places. Instead, it's copied, or there are just, okay, reference there, and then there's no reference back or anything. Yes. Um, the structure of law is horrible yes. <laughs> when you look at it as code. What, what's your uh, experience with the new Icelandic constitution? Was it the same? Or were they trying to have a more, um, more structural approach to it? Um, it's kind of hard to say whether or not it was a more structural approach. I mean, it was, it was structured, it was sectioned and that kind of thing, but constitutions are kind of too short for a lot of that to really show yeah. up. Um, because basically constitutions are like your, your fundamental program header and your definition of all the operators, you know, and then it's, it's really hard to say, well, okay, yes, they didn't have a specifically OO definition of plus, but, you know, is it going to be good functional code or, or bad spaghetti code? Who knows? The exception to this is the South African constitution. Oh, God, yes. The South African constitution is horrific. It's like... Oh, Hundreds of pages long. They included everything. Or the e oh. EU constitution. Um, the EU one. constitution, the proposed EU yeah, constitution, except it was, renamed. was not nearly as bad as the South African constitution. Oh, come on. The South African constitution is really, a, it is a thing to behold. <laughs> It'll take you about a day to read. Uh, so I found it very uh, fascinating that you said that. Uh, Sharia law, for instance, does not allow deductive reasoning, uh, and that, that makes me wonder how many, how many different, you know, kinds, very different kinds of law are there in the world? And the obvious question I must ask: How do I, as a non-member of parliament, uh, find um, a remote law execution box that I can use? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well. Um... So, broadly speaking, you can say there's, I guess, maybe seven um, kind of uh, Catholic or indigenous legal traditions, um, which tend to share a lot of very similar features. Um, uh, Talmudic, um, Sharia, common, civil, Confucian, um, Hindu. So those are kind of the big families of law and the big families of reasoning, which tend to map to the big uh, families of uh, cultural tradition, um, except that we've produced a couple here in the West. Um, as far as remote law execution bugs go, I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, I mean, regulatory capture basically is a remote law execution bug, right? Um, you know, so there, there, there are lots of people using them. Mostly they employ lawyers to find them. Um, but that's just because we don't have another word for people who spend a lot of time poking at the law and seeing how it breaks up in the lawyer. Uh, when we do code these days, uh, we use a lot of test cases. We have uh, unit tests and we have integration tests. Would this be something to apply to lawmaking as well, that you have a set of test cases and you compare the text of the law against each, each case? Yeah, I think you could totally write unit cases for law. I mean, especially unit cases for a constitution. You know, you can come up with a bunch of different, like, basically, common potential societal occurrences. You know, does the constitution handle X? Does the constitution handle Y? Part of the problem with that is that um, those unit tests are going to be different in every sort of society because they're culturally contextual. Um, and you don't generally... Like, it takes a bit of experience with writing unit tests in a given context to understand what the appropriate set of unit tests for that context are. Um, and even if you get to write a bunch of constitutions, you don't generally get a bunch to write a bunch of constitutions for the same cultural context. 
Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a chicken and egg in the development process there. But it, uh, it might be interesting to, to cope with that. You know. I mean, as you evolve the Constitution, you, you need to make sure against your test cases that uh, it hasn't changed some, something uh, what you already fixed. Yeah, I mean, I think the way I would, the way I would tend to prefer doing that is kind of publish all the metrics that we're using as far as, you know, like complexity, ambiguity, you know, undefined variables, that kind of stuff. So that's one, and that's sort of one level of unit test. That's the lint level. Um, but then also publish the threat model so that you can, um, you know, go back to the threat model and see how potential revisions would change it. Who's next? I lost track. I'm going to start over there. So um, Trike is a tool for, I mean, it's basically a data tracking tool that lets you keep track of all of the kind of structured data that comprises the threat model um, because there's a lot of different bits and pieces and then does kind of the cross-referencing as it's, um, you know, it, it does the computation that it's, that it's possible for a machine to do, um, but a lot of it is just as a, uh, just a data tracking tool. Um, so there's two versions of it up on the web right now. There's a quite old small talk version, which we need to rebuild into something that implements the rest of the new methodology. And then there's a spreadsheet version, which tracks, which is current, but, but is running, has, has hit the limits of what you can do with the spreadsheet, basically. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, is this nation building or is this state building? <laughs> oh. Ooh. Um, because, I mean, to me, nation is something a little different, but it seems to me that this legal structure is yes, this is, state. is more state building. Um, Maybe I'm being pedantic. Yeah, I was, I was, I was not being sufficiently exact in the title. Because <laughs> um, well, when I talked earlier, I was talking about nation state, and I realized actually when I spoke that I've, you've, got to, you've got to be very precise when yeah. you talk about those things because I was yeah. a little worried that nation state is also a, 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 dis a disputed term in terms of that thing. So yeah, yeah, no, this is participatory state building. Although, it is participatory state-like entity building. I mean, there's no reason why this has to be a, a, a nation state as such. No, you could have, you you know. could have nations that are not tied to state. And yeah, be. yeah. Uh, it's basically just a little comment on the unit tests thing. Basically, unit tests, uh, the obvious thing that I can think of as a unit test for law is a court case. That's what really what they are. They're unit tests. So, Really, what you need is to set up kind of mock court cases. Where you ex because a court case is where you execute the law. So you'd have to execute it on a made-up test case. So basically a little theater with real judges. Uh, that would be kind of expensive, but it's doable. Yeah, although I, I wonder if it would be possible to... Um, I think you could basically extract the parts of the court case which are useful. And, and just run that separately. Like you don't need to, to invoke the whole program just to test a little piece of logic. Uh, my question is, have you, I mean, since we're talking about, you know, uh, dose attacks and the remote law execution and all that, have you thought about, do you think it's at all possible to, to uh, um, just like I have, a, you know, Python or Scheme or something like that, uh, you know, Actually, make a language. Well, I mean uh, that you can. I mean that you can an interpreter that you can actually run human tests on. And, uh, I don't the think that. I mean, I, I think the different legal traditions are the different languages of law. You know, I don't. I don't. And basically, I think that trying to fully formalize the process to the point where it's literally executable, you're going to run into a lot of problems where human reality maps very poorly to executable code in the end, and you're going to run into problems. So it's, it's very useful to have a certain amount of fuzz. So there's the other thing that um, law is written in human languages, which are three languages in the Chomsky model, uh, whereas computer uh, programming languages are normally context sensitive. So uh, you basically have a divide between which uh, you cannot parse certain statements. Right. Find out that 
your data it, it has a very, as you said, it's, it's culturally contextual that you know, they have the nation geographically wants one thing and the other half wants another. That's politics. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> basically, yeah, but I mean, you know, I, we... There, there, there definitely are countries where you have different, you know, different cultural traditions which bring with them different legal contexts of understanding into the picture. Um, on the other hand, to, so basically by the time you get around to writing a constitution, it is incumbent on whatever structural entity created the constitutional assembly to have determined which cultural and traditional base they intend to use as the logical base, you know, to, to build the constitution on. If they can't come to a decision on what the fundamental logical base that they wish to um, use to build their constitution on top of is, it's probably not going to be a successful constitutional process, um, just because there are going to be people shooting each other shortly thereafter. Um, so, you know, we, I think, I mean, that would be a problem, but I don't think it will ever get to us to solve it. I think it will always end up being someone else's problem. Yeah, okay. Well, I see kind of a potential here for making the nation state, you know, with borders obsolete in, in the sense that it can be dynamic. So we can have different geographical areas with, with a set of rules in, in one uh, specific area that can overlap with another area that has a set of specific tools for, for a separate. I mean, there are there are things like that, um, which is basically private law. You know, where you have um, uh, most commonly either Sharia or Talmudic law used for um, uh, you know managing like interactions kind of within families or business transactions within a specific community um, in a larger context of like civil or common law. Um, and then there's stuff like Belgium, um, <laughs> but. Uh, um, I mean, for the most part, nation states tend to map to hard infrastructure, so it's hard to have a dynamic um, legal regime because the infrastructure really doesn't want to move. Uh, I would just like to point out uh, an example of that, or a kind of an example of that case, which is really something that we all here have a tendency to work within. Creative Commons and GPL licenses, and really all licenses and all legal texts written by non-state organizations that are then interpreted within the context of various uh, legal codes in countries. Yeah, so you could, I mean, in theory, you could create a, a uniform legal code that crossed countries that was implemented by kind of the shim layer of contract law um, that, you know, was, was written, you know, was ported for each, for each country. Um, that is what GPL is. Yeah, in but for a very very small. Yeah, doing that for um, doing that for more substantive law is going to be really difficult. Um, basically, because you uh, because rights are inalienable in most Western contexts, you can't either you cannot easily either contractually create new rights or contractually take away those existing rights. Um, so there's there's like serious limits on what that shin layer could do. I think we're we're about yep. out of time here. It's been really interesting, so thank you very much, Eleanor.